Thank you for joining us this morning for our live stream. Before we get going real quick, I want to just let you know how much we love providing this streaming service so that you can worship with us. Please know that you're always, always invited to join us in person. There's something so special and important about simply being together and walking the journey of faith with one another. If you're considering joining us in person, we have services at 8.30, 10, and 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. If you're unable to join us in person, we would love for you to consider inviting people into your home for worship, discussion, and study of God's Word. Regardless of your situation, we pray that the Lord speaks through this morning's worship and that your faith would be encouraged, stretched, and grown as a result. To God be all the glory and praise. Blessings. Waiting can be so difficult. Remember when I was younger, and I think many younger kids share the sentiment that when I was about this big, it was so hard to wait for the next meal. Even if the first one had just gotten over with, already excited for the next one. In fact, there'd be a snack or two in between. It was so hard to just wait for the next meal. So hard to wait for the last day of school, the end of the school year, and you know it's going to be sunny and beautiful outside, and, and you've got all these assignments and things that you're trying to complete, and, and homework and tests and responsibility, and you can't wait until that day, and you have that freedom where all of those things fall off your shoulders, and you get to enjoy the freedom of summer. Other things can be difficult to wait for as well. Maybe you were excited for when you graduated high school and then went on to your college that you had chosen or the workplace that you had chosen to work in and and could start making decisions about long-term parts of your life. Maybe you couldn't wait until the day that you got married and and you knew exactly who that person was you were going to spend the rest of your life with and and then begin to to do the things that married people do and they they buy a house and they have children and they go and do this or that and go on trips together and and all kinds of things. Maybe you couldn't wait until you were married so you knew those things were in place. Maybe as you decided to have children, you were waiting and waiting and waiting for children, and and that waiting didn't go anywhere. Maybe you were waiting for that moment, and maybe you decided to to take on an adoption process, and as you you and your family waited for that little one to come into your family, you never knew when that call would come. You never knew when that moment would arrive. You You never knew, but you were just there waiting. The moments where we know the end date can be, mo- can be difficult enough to wait for. But it's really difficult to wait for those moments where you don't know when that end date is going to be. We, we go through life and we wait and we wait and we wait and, and, and then we wait for retirement. We're excited for that moment where we get to, to be finished with our career and, and then be able to focus on some other things that we've been looking forward to in life. And so we're waiting for that moment and, and then maybe we're waiting for grandkids because those are so exciting. My great uncle would always say that if he knew how fun grandkids were, he would have had them first. We're waiting for things to come and things that we hope for, and we have dreams and hopes and aspirations, and we're always waiting. And so it's not a matter of if we're waiting, it's a matter of how we're going to wait. We, as the people of God, want to be faithfully waiting. We want to be faithful in our waiting process because so much of life is waiting for what is to come. We find the disciples in our text this morning they're waiting and waiting and waiting for, for Jesus to restore the kingdom of Israel. And, and doing so, we've, we've gone through the last several weeks where we talked about them waiting for the king, waiting for the one who was going to restore Israel to power and, and, and set them free from their bondage. And then, and then they were confused. So they were waiting while they were confused because this king that they had assumed would be that guy was put on a cross and buried in the tomb. 
And then they were waiting with joy because then he reappeared to them. He rose from the grave and and he showed himself to them and and talked to them and ate with them and encountered them in a very powerful way and many others in their day. And then here we find them waiting again. Waiting for something that they don't really know what to expect or waiting for something that they don't really know what it'll look like, or what it'll feel like, or or they just don't really even know exactly what they're waiting for. So Jesus talks to his disciples in Acts chapter 1. We've been following Luke's writings. We're continuing this morning in the book of Acts. I'd like to start reading with uh, verse 4, where Jesus uh, speaks to his disciples. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. So here the disciples are on this roller coaster of sequence of events, and, and, and here again they're still confused. I want to draw our attention to that because last week we read about how Jesus opened their eyes to understand the scriptures, that, the, that they would understand what was going on. But I want us to recognize that they, he didn't give them complete understanding of all things. And sometimes we're waiting for that moment where we get it, or we're waiting for that moment where, where we understand it all makes perfect sense. But, but even when Christ opened their eyes, they still became confused. They're still thinking, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom uh, to Israel? Is this the time where you're going to set up your rule and reign here on earth? We're right here. We're waiting with you. And we're excited for this moment. And as they're excited for that moment, he gives them the instruction to wait. And then he just rises from their presence. And they're staring up in the sky. They might be more confused by the fact that they just saw a man rise up from their presence and be hidden by a cloud, or they might be confused by what just happened. He, he was our king, and then he, he was dead, and then he wasn't our king, and now he's our king, and then, and then he's gone again. This, this whole process of confusion, they're on this roller coaster, and what he tells them to do is go to Jerusalem and wait and they probably think in Jesus, we've been waiting, we've been waiting. But they go. They go and they wait. They wait for the spirit that they don't exactly know what that means. But they probably have some idea of the Holy Spirit because of uh, how the spirit led the people through the desert, through uh, after they left Egypt. They probably had some idea of what the spirit did and how powerful it was based on the temple and the Holy of Holies and the priests who had to do a number of different things to even enter into that place. They probably had some idea, but I guarantee they didn't expect tongues of fire to land on their heads and for them to begin speaking and thousands would come to Christ. I bet they didn't expect that, but they were were told to go and to wait. Now, one thing that I want to point out is that when we think of waiting, we often think of waiting just as a passive twiddling our thumbs. We're just going to wait for something to happen. And, And that's not what the disciples did. They did not wait passively. They waited actively. 
They went back to Jerusalem and, and to fulfill the scriptures and to, and to uh, further establish the disciples. They, they had to replace Judas because Judas was gone, and, and so they had to find someone else to fill his place. And so while they're waiting, they appoint someone to, to take Judas's place. While they're waiting, they are spending time in prayer. While they're waiting, they are worshiping together in the temple and eating together and spending time together. And so they are at a place where they are actively waiting. And we see in Thessalonians where Paul's writing to the Thessalonian church and, and, and they had heard that, that Christ was going to return before the end of the age. And what they interpreted that to mean was before my lifetime ends, Christ is going to return. And so I just have to wait for him to, to come back. And I don't need to be about working and, and working for the kingdom. I don't need to be doing anything other than just waiting and hoping he comes soon. It could be any moment. So we're just going to wait and we're going to ignore all the things that, that we have to do and get done and, and, uh, and all the, the work of the church in the kingdom. We're just going to, to stare at the sky and wait for his return. And Paul writes to them again and he says, says no, that's, that's not what you are called to do. Um, in Thessalonians 2, this is where he's talking about it. And, and he says that, no, we need to be about the work of the kingdom. While we're waiting, we have to be about the work of our Heavenly Father. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died a death that we deserve. He rose again that we can be with our Heavenly Father, both now and for eternity. And he ascended into heaven and gave us instructions. And, and we're to be about his work, sharing the gospel with people in our area and, and to the ends of the earth. And so, and so Paul reminds them that waiting is not just a passive process. It is, a, it is an active sense of waiting. We want to be faithful as we wait. Now, we see that um, waiting can be challenging. Waiting can be boring. Waiting can feel unproductive. Waiting can feel inefficient. It can sometimes feel like we're wandering around, especially if we don't know what is said to come is going to actually happen. And if it, if it waits too long and it keeps on waiting, we keep on waiting, keep on waiting, we, we wonder, is this actually going to take place? And we know that Christ will return because we've received that promise. And so we have to think about what does it look like for us as God's people to wait faithfully as Christ has promised to return, as we expect him to return, uh, we don't know when that's going to be. And so what does it look like to wait faithfully? We want to be a people who wait faithfully. Now, we know that um, in the scripture, it gives us a little glimpse of what it looks like to be waiting and as we wait, we see all kinds of chaos. We see all kinds of turmoil. We see all kinds of things happening within our world. And it can be easy for us to just want to, to throw it all away and say, Jesus, come today. I'm ready. Uh, just go ahead and come. Just take us out of this place because everything is, it can't be worse than it, than it is now. It's never going to be any better than this, but God, just, just take this place away and take us to be with you. And so when we do that, if we think through that, and if we uh, look at the news and look at the bad reports and look at everything chaotic that's going on in our life, we can sometimes see some similarities that we feel in Revelation and Daniel and say, surely this is the end. But we know that Christ will return whenever he's ready. So being faithful has a lot less to do with knowing the time and the date, and it has a lot more to do with our proximity to him, our drawing near to him, our listening to his spirit, our, our waiting on his spirit to lead us and guide us in everything that we say and everything that we do, that he might be made known. If we take on this notion that this world is going uh, to hell in a handbasket and we just want to be out of this place, uh, we fall into the same a trouble that the people that Peter wrote to. In 2 Peter verses 3 
uh, chapter 3, verse 9, uh, Peter gives them some insight, and he tells them, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So if we have this mentality that I'm ready to go, God, just come and take me now, we completely overlook the people that God's heart is for to come and know him. And so as we wait for him, we have to recognize that there are people in our midst, people in our community, people in our state, our nation, our world that don't know Jesus. And it is God's desire that they come to know him that they hear about who he is, that they experience who he is through the way that we love them and care for them and and, and meet the needs that they have and express our care for them. We have to be a people who are after the heart of God and faithfully waiting by taking the good news of the gospel to those who don't know it. We have to be a people who are after God's heart and have a heart for people that don't know him. And if he came right now, there are people outside of this place that do not know who Jesus is. And so while we're waiting and looking forward to and anticipating his return, we also want him to wait as long as possible so that we can share the good news with more and more and more people. Because we want them to know him. We want them to experience what we've experienced, the cleansing of our sins, that we might live in his presence both now and forevermore. And so we have this message, we have this reconciling effort that God has has given to us to take to the world. And so, yes, we want to see him return. We also pray that, that he waits, that he gives us more time. You see, there's this thing called an eclipse coming tomorrow. And there's all kinds of rumors and things about what the eclipse means. Uh, The last eclipse, I think, was seven years ago or something like that in 2017. There's been a number of them in the past hundred or so years. There's been, there's going to be another one in 2042 or something around those lines. And, and, and within all of these uh, speculations, there is word about it being the moment that Christ will return or a symbol of God's judgment on uh, his people. And so we need to be paying attention and watching for this moment. And I just want us to know that, that we don't know when he's going to return. The people who are saying those things don't have any idea if he's going to return today or tomorrow or the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year or the next 10,000 years. We don't know when he's going to return. So if someone tells you when he's going to return, it is not for us to know. That is God's, it is only for God to know. It's what he says in this passage in Acts. We, on the other hand, need to be concerned with how we are waiting faithfully for him. Because the truth is, if I'm walking with him each and every day, if I'm talking with him each and every day, if I am going about what he has called me to go about each and every day, I don't care when he returns, because I'm going to be ready And as I'm ready, I hope to bring as many people along with me as possible. And so it is not our concern, the date and the time and the method and the location and all those pieces of when and where he returns. Rather, we need to be focused on walking with Christ and his Holy Spirit each and every day. We need to be people who wait faithfully. People who listen to the voice of God. People who know his word. People who share our heart with him. People who wait for him to give us instructions and commands and, 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 and to show us the way. We need to be people who hang on his every word. And, and mind you, one of those things by itself isn't enough. You see, the people who uh, crucified Jesus were the ones who had the Bible memorized. 
By age 11, they memorized the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And then those who were the smartest of those groups would, would, would serve under a teacher or a rabbi. And by age 17, they would have mostly, if not all, of the scriptures memorized. So they knew the history, they knew the prophecy, they knew the Psalms, they knew everything in the scriptures. And when the very person that the scriptures described came to be in front of them, they put him on a cross and they killed him. And so we need to be about knowing his word and need to be about listening to his spirit, need to be open to walking in his way, need to be open to hearing from uh, the, the very God that we serve. And in doing so, we will be ready. My prayer for us this morning is that we know our Heavenly Father. My prayer for us is that we are excited for the day He returns, that we go to be with Him, whether, we, whether He comes or whether we pass away and go to be with We are excited for that day, but, but my, my prayer is also that our heart longs for the people who don't know the gospel. My prayer is that we're obedient in sharing the gospel. My prayer is that we are a people who love others so well that they know Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the person that we live for. And in doing so, may his kingdom ever increase. That is my hope for us as his church, that we would be faithful as we wait. Um, Peter gives us a little bit um, more insight into what it means to be faithful as we wait. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, he says, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, has forgotten what he has, that he has been cleansed from his past sins. I hope as we journey away from Easter, away from the time that we remember Christ's death and resurrection, that we don't forget that we've been forgiven, that we've been cleansed, and that we grow in each and every one of these areas. And as we do, he will be effective and productive in us. So while waiting feels unproductive sometimes and inefficient out there, it's not out there necessarily that God is most concerned for. It's what's going on in here. And then everything within here that he's producing and that he's doing within our hearts would then play out in our lives to the people that we interact with on a daily, weekly, monthly, however often basis. That they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, that they might feel your love, and that they might experience his love, that they might be drawn even just a little bit closer, and that we might pray that they would come to know our heavenly Father. Now, that can be a difficult thing for us to pray for, because as you do this, there will be people that you are praying for, and that you encounter that you share the gospel with, that you share your love with and your care for, who will never come to know him. But we need to be a people who are faithful to take his message to each and every person as much as we possibly can, as he leads and as he guides, that we might know him and that they might come to know him also. Let's bow for prayer this morning.